Hi everyone, I'm William, programmer and 2D artist at Bite Me Games. Today I wanted to walk you through the process I go through when creating 2D art for our games or company. First things first, I'm far from a qualified artist, but I'll do my best to show you that even a basic understanding of 2D art can help a team or even a solo dev make a work more unique and focused. Before working at Bite Me Games, I didn't have a lot of experience yet with digital drawing, uh, sticking to the more analog methods of pencil and paper mostly. When I'm working on a game, this isn't really, much as, really as much of an option though, hence why 2D digital art is the way to go. Before I walk you through the workflow I use for the R2D art, uh, I want to talk about the tools that I use. On the hardware side, I did my first digital drawings on a Wacom Intuos S. While it's a great budget drawing tablet, the lack of screen meant that for someone like me who has pretty poor hand-eye coordination, it was frustrating to work with at times. When we got more serious with Python games and I was going to focus more on the digital 2D art of uh, the company, I went ahead and upgraded myself to a Canvas 16 2021 edition. The built-in screen makes it much more easier for me to draw, uh, while not breaking the bank either. Another good budget brand to get started with can be an XP Pen, which Marnix uses. Um, a last option if you don't own a drawing tablet yet, but have, for example, an iPad laying around. Getting an Apple Pencil can be another way to get started with digital art. On the software side, the Wacom Intuos S came with a license for Clip Studio Paint, um, a program normally used for drawing anime and manga, but it's perfectly usable for creating any digital art. As I'm more comfortable with it, I've been using it for our current projects. Um, as well, has all the basics, just the same basics as most editors, uh, be it layers, vectors, fill tool, uh, it has everything you could require. Other software you could use though would be something like Autodesk Sketchbook, Krita or even Photoshop if you want to. Now that I've told you how my set looks like, I'm going to go through the workflow that I maintain for creating art, be it sprites, reference art or logos. First, I start with a few thumbnails. With this I don't mean the thumbnails our YouTube videos have, I, I leave those to the Marnix. Depending on the importance or the IDs I have, the number of thumbnails can range from two or three to maybe eight or more. For a thumbnail, the important part is to get the core of your idea across and not get caught in little details, using more primitive shapes like squares, rectangles, circles, and then and don't go too elaborate with the figures yet. Sometimes it's easy to have a few colors, but don't focus on finding the correct color palette for whatever you're trying yet. Don't forget to use any reference art that helps you envision what you want. You can import them into your paint tool or use dedicated reference art programs to keep them visible at all times, overlaid on top of your screen. When I've finished as many thumbnails as I want or feel like I need to get my ideas across, it's time to get feedback. If you are a solo dev, you'll still want to try and get feedback on your designs, be it from friends, family members, or even the internet, as it's hard to notice your own flaws sometimes. If you work in a group, like I do, it's also important to get everyone's thoughts on something to make sure your visions do align in the end. This is especially important in core parts of your game, like the main character or the logo of your game. Take any feedback to heart, but also don't just accept any criticism as is. If they say they don't like something, ask what's wrong with it. Get input on how you could improve it in a way that everyone likes it. I write down any feedback I get, any points I have to address, and then I return to the thumbnail except to make a few more thumbnails. Usually there are fewer this time, as my vision becomes more fixed on what we want. Then go back into feedback phase and repeat this a few times until there is a clear idea of what we want to have as an end result. The sketching phase is where you start fleshing out the final thumbnails into a single fully sized image. For this I use the pencil tool and start freehand drawing, keeping my thumbnails and reference art close by. I go for still rough sketches while also starting to bring up in a bit more detail. You don't have to make the lines perfect yet at this point, I just fo focus on creating a stencil for myself to draw over. And then we get to the first step of actually creating the end result, the inking. For this I use a pen tool with a higher stabilization for smoother lines. You can also use vector lines for this stage, but Clip Studio Paint support for colorized Vector art is pretty much non-existent, and thus I went with the old-fashioned way. This is a stage where I add all the details and get a finished, colorless end product. Then comes the second step of creating the end result, the coloring. 
For this, I use the fill tool for the rough coloring and then go over edges and inconsistencies with a pen tool. I don't worry about any shading yet and just focus on getting the base colors in place. As a continuation on the coloring, now that I have a base color set laid down, I can have different shades of the colors the use of shadowing, imagining a certain light source throwing light from somewhere and using edges and places where light would be hard to get to. I start coloring these parts with the different shades of the color to create an imitation of shadows and depth. I tend to limit myself to four shades, uh, base, light, light shadow and dark shadow. Base is just the base color of the coloring step. Light is where light hits items, so a slightly lighter color. Light shadow is where light shadow is being cast, um, just slightly darker from the base color. And dark shadow is for covered places and edges where it's hard for the light to illuminate it, which is even darker than the uh, light shadow. Then the final step, uh, and that is to go through the entire end result and look for inconsistencies. Perhaps I missed a spot with coloring. Maybe a line from inking could be moved a bit. Maybe I made a part too shaded or want a tiny bit more detail. Those are things that can happen and I'll fix them in this final stage. But these are the seven steps are, uh, for the workflow I maintain to create 2D art for our games. It may look daunting and it really is, even if you're unfamiliar with drawing, uh, but it's satisfying to have your own art in your games. Google or Bing, if, that, if you're into that, is your friend, best friend for finding references to help you focus your vision. Try drawing regularly to get a feel for it and don't waste too much time on a single piece. Come back to it later and you may have new inspirations on how to produce what you had in visions. And finally, why would I recommend to do any game supporter? What are the benefits of it? Well, it allows you to create a personalized art style for your game. It helps you convey what you imagine to any fellow companions working on the project. And even if it's not a masterpiece, it will still be something that you made yourself and that alone is worth the merit. And that concludes how I work as a 2D artist in our company. Are there any things you struggle with when creating 2D assets? Let us know in the comments down below. Do you have any suggestions? Do let me know as well on how I could improve my workflow. Apart from that, if you haven't yet, be sure to subscribe and hit that bell icon to be notified whenever we create a new video. And that's been all for me this week. We'll see you guys again next week.